Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. Welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with you. Vicki Joy Anderson with us. Vicki, welcome back. How have you been? Hello, Vicki. I don't hear Vicki. Well, let's go to this. You there, Vicki? I, 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 Yeah, your cell's horrible right, right now, but we'll try to work on Zoom during the break. So how have you been? I've been great, George. Can you hear me better now? Oh, much better. Much better. Wonderful. Let's do this. So all is good with you, okay? We've got the connection hooked up with you, but sleep paralysis got to you too then, right? <laughs> I guess. They always got to mess with the tech, huh? Absolutely. What is exactly sleep paralysis? Well, it is a phenomenon that has been experienced by thousands, if not tens of thousands of people. Uh, in the past, we were reticent to speak about it, lest we be slapped with a schizophrenic label or, or worse. But now that there is a disclosure and more people feel comfortable talking about these things, a lot of people are talking about it. It's a phenomenon during sleep where people feel that there is some sort of entity or oppressive darkness in the room that overcomes them. Many people report being paralyzed, not being able to move. Uh, they, they talk about horror movie-like experiences of, of dread and having their souls dragged to hell very strange spiritual supernatural things to be attached to something if it's simply narcolepsy. Is it tied to the brain at all? I think that it is, George, and specifically I think it is probably tied into our pineal gland, uh, which we know has been called the, the seat or the window of the soul by philosophers in days past. And I definitely think that uh, it is exacerbated when we are on various psychotropic medication or over-the-counter drugs, which uh, shows me that it is tied into our neural pathways. Now, how about uh, night terrors? Very similar to sleep paralysis, related? It's similar. It's definitely within the same umbrella, but it is a different phenomenon. People with night terrors tend to, they, they can move, they can scream. In fact, you can usually hear them um, a mile away. A night terror is a very loud, violent, aggressive thrashing, whereas sleep paralysis is a very quiet, silent paralyzation. And unlike sleep paralysis, where most people have a very vivid account the next day of what happened to them, a lot of people who experience night terrors will have no memory the next day of having anything having happened. How many people does this happen to percentage-wise, Vicki? The statistics online, depending on where you're looking, will say anywhere from 17 to 51 percent. Uh, that's only the people that are admitting to it. So I, I think the statistic is actually much higher. What does modern medicine say about this? Well, they have different things to say. Uh, they kind of have their own agenda. Most of the official online narratives, they're going to chalk it off to narcolepsy, sleep apnea, stress, trauma. And it's not that those things cannot come into play and be intermingled with the phenomenon, that's for sure. But what I feel like they don't have a really satisfying answer to is why shadow people and incubuses and succubuses and various black shadows and red glowing eyes and alien grays tend to accompany this phenomenon. Well, that's a good point. Now, they have come up with phrases that are tied into some of these things, the incubus, the succubus. What what are they? Yeah, the, that's the one everyone wants to talk about. They're also known as the, the ubi entities because the plural is the incubi and the succubi. This is the ones that you'll hear celebrities and things talking about. But I think it's more accurate to classify these as vampiric beings. If you're going by the ancient definition of the UVs, because this is in Mesopotamian, Akkadian, Sumerian lore, etc., Epic of Gilgamesh, and 
uh, in various ancient Mesopotamian writings about the Apkalu, as well as various other places, Dead Sea Scrolls, etc. They aren't just sexual demons. They are also known for bloodletting, blood drinking, draining the life force, terrorizing victims at night, nightmares, shape-shifting, and in ancient lore, even death. So it sounds like, Vicki Joy, that these entities are beyond the imagination of somebody going to sleep, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, you always get the, the accusation, and you get this in UFO lore as well, that the reason why everyone's describing the same entities, the reason why they're all saying that they're gray or green and they're three feet tall with big, big black eyes is because they've all swapped stories and they've all read the same accounts and they're just sharing this collective mass hysteria. But the fact of the matter is there are uh, accounts that go all the way back to the 16th, 17th century where people didn't have the Internet, they didn't have television, they weren't sharing stories, and they were all explaining the same phenomenon. They were explaining the same creatures, the same entities, the same experience. And so there is, I hope, George, we've reached a point in disclosure and a point in knowledge and research and in the hive mind mentality I hope that we've all gotten to a point where we can be intellectually honest about this, that if thousands of people are saying that they've had this experience and seen these things, let's let's believe the victims. Let's listen to them. Let's hear them out. Oh, absolutely. No question about that. Lots of people, Vicki Joy, claim that they are abducted by aliens. You think it could be something else? Well, yeah, you know, depending on who you're talking, every, you know, quadrant has their own uh, specific agenda and their own idea of who this could be. I really wish everyone would come to the same table because I think we all have pieces of the puzzle and we would benefit from hearing each other's stories. But, you know, the the doctors have an explanation. The psychiatrists have an explanation. uh, the, The sleep experts have an explanation. The brain scientists have an explanation. But the pastors and the priests have explanations too. The occult has an explanation. The new age has an explanation. And so if we relegate all of this to narcolepsy or we relegate all of this to demon possession, we're going to miss key ingredients to this and we're not going to ever really understand the full story. Part of the reason why we can't get to the bottom of this, so many people are suffering from it, is because people are plugging their ears and they're only willing to listen to their own narrative. And so they're missing key pieces of the puzzle. Pretty interesting. How did you come upon all this? In your biblical studies or or not? No. In fact, it's very hard to find a pastor who's willing to talk about or even believe these things. It's one of the problems I have in my work is I I get a lot of phone calls from Christians and Catholics and religious people who have come to me because uh, when they have gone to their religious leaders, they're, they're either gaslit, they're, they're eye-rolled, or they're, they're, they're shooed away. There's not a lot of training in seminary for this kind of thing. And my, my interest, which is, you know, probably a poor choice of words, but what, what caused me to stumble upon this was 40 years of experiencing it on a continual, consistent basis and not having anyone to speak to because they either thought that you needed to be exercised by a priest or put on heavy psychotropic medication. And the fact of the matter, George, is the the people that are suffering from this, they're not crazy. They don't have low IQs. They're not uneducated. They're very healthy, intelligent individuals, and they're looking for answers. Your title is They Only Come Out at Night, and that seems to be the case in all these cases. How come? Well, I think that in the past, that was the most advantageous time to come to people because it's the time when an average person experiences several several times of altered states of consciousness. We fall into altered states of consciousness as we go in and out of various sleep stages and as we go to sleep and wake up. And so it's an ideal time where this veil is thin. Uh, now, you can... You can obviously have these encounters in the daytime. People can have them during a nice Sunday nap. Uh, And if you have got uh, chemicals involved, if there is psychedelics or various drugs and things involved, 
really the key isn't the moon. The key is altered states of consciousness. That seems to be the liminal space. And doesn't the sleep paralysis also occur moments before you go to sleep? Well, yes, it, it can happen moments before you fall asleep or moments before you wake up. And the, the fancy terms for that are hypnopompic and hypnagogic for those waiting for the quiz later on. Uh, but as we drift into sleep and out of sleep, there's these brief moments of altered states of consciousness. And so they've got two shots at you. <laughs> now, do you think all these cases are real or what's going on here? Not necessarily, uh, George. Obviously, you know, sometimes they're, they're just nightmares. Sometimes it can be hallucinatory from psychedelics. You hear a lot of people that talk about very similar. Uh, is there a distinct difference, Vicki Joy, between sleep paralysis, which seems medical, and night terrors, which seems like evil entities? Um, yeah, there is a difference between the two. I do think evil entities come into play in both scenarios. Night tears, for the most part, seem to target young children. It seems to be something that happens in adolescence. A lot of times sleep paralysis begins at puberty or hits at puberty. This is, of course, generalizations. They can hit at any time. But many people with sleep paralysis also report shadow men, hat men, alien greys, gargoyles, blacker than black shadows, spiders, snakes, uh, demons, gargoyles, imps, you name it. So we definitely see the presence of entities in sleep paralysis scenarios as well. Are some of them seeing entities, you know, like shadows on the wall that uh, a light may be casting? It's almost like that scenario with clouds where you look at a cloud, you see a face, and there's really no face. But it looks like it. Is that possible? Absolutely. There have to be several things at play for it to be a legitimate sleep paralysis encounter. There are... There are levels of dread and fear that accompany it that's not just, I think, someone's broken into the home. There are uh, disembodied voices typically in one's head. Uh, Pretty much everyone collectively reports a feeling that their soul is in jeopardy and that they're going to be dragged to hell or into the abyss. And so there's a sense that one cannot move. They're paralyzed. There's a lot more going on. So if it's just a shadow by the door, uh, chances are you've, you've got a cat or a streetlight issue. How did these vampires get into this picture? <laughs> well, actually, I think that initially, back in the day, that's what they were. You know, we've sort of demoted this cast of characters down to one-dimensional beings. Uh, they're, they're nebulous. They're vague. The Shadow Man the hat man, the grays. And so they just seem like shadowy figures. But in ancient lore, in Mesopotamian lore uh, in particular, the Lamashtu, they they actually had names, George, and they had uh, identities and personality traits, and they were worshipped even though they were feared. And so Lamashtu was dubbed the demon lord, the goddess of monsters, the mother of beasts, the mistress of insanity, and other cultures had their own version of Lamashu. There was the Lamia and the Lalitu and the Lilu, and of course Lilith, as most of us have heard of. And these were night-stalking demonesses who would come out at night and would take the life force of of women and children and defenseless people as they slept. So, in the original backstory lore before they became these one-dimensional hat man, shadow man. These were real gods and goddesses in various pantheons and were worshipped as entities uh, that were that were real and were considered to be gods and titans. Now, are most of these entities evil and bad? Are there any good ones here? Well, you know, there can be good and bad entities that we interact with in the spiritual realm. I mean, even, you know, in the Bible, we have angels that come down, and we have examples where characters would go into the third heaven and see the throne room of God. And so I think a better question then, are they they good or evil, is 
are they safe or are they dangerous? And why that's a better question is because whether good or evil, not, not any of these entities are what I would classify as safe in the sense that they're not our species. So they don't, they're not necessarily going to think, act, behave, or emote the way that we instinctive, instinctively believe that they will or they should. So uh, I think that we have to be careful letting our feelings and our emotions lead us because there's a lot of people that encounter evil entities that experience euphoric feelings of love and light. And then there are people that experience good or angelic beings, like those in the Bible, that were terrified when they came into contact with these beings. So we need a better litmus test than how good we felt or how safe we felt when we were in the presence of one of these things. Vicki Joy, what do they want? What's their end game? Well, I think there's there's a short-term easy answer and there's a more long-term complex answer. In the short term, if you go with sort of the theological dictionary definition of a lot of these entities, for the ones that are disembodied spirits, whether they're the dead or they're the Nephilim, depending on your worldview, they have lost their bodies. They're looking for vessels because they vicariously want to enjoy being human. They want to re, re-engage with the five senses. They want to be able to touch and taste and feel again and experience emotions. So they're feeling in their disembodied state, they are unable to, to get a, a full sense of, of being alive, so to speak. But the, the longer, more complex uh, answer to that, George, would be that they, they do want allegiance. There's a reason why these were considered gods and goddesses to the ancients, uh, because they did elicit worship and devotion from, from those that, that saw them. Can they be stopped? Absolutely. Easier than most people think. Uh, This goes back into the idea that these are vampiric entities. And just like in Hollywood and in the romantic tales of of vampires, there's this there's this rule, this this unwritten rule that a vampire cannot bother you unless it's given invitation and it steps over the threshold. And likewise, if it is not given invitation or it is denied that invitation or it is told to get out, this is really their kryptonite, and this is where our power lies. They really cannot harass us uh, if we if we don't want to be harassed. And if we've opened a door somehow, uh, we only need to figure out how to close that door. I notice that you dedicate your book to one of our guests, Russ Dizdar, who passed away a couple of years ago. Good, He was a good yeah. guy. Good guy. He was, he was a great guy and a good friend. I miss him. When you were taking Bible studies at the university, did you ever expect that you'd be dealing with these kinds of entities? <laughs> Not at all. In fact, George, it's funny. I remember one Bible class in particular where they were kind of starting to go into the, you know, the, the fringes of, you know, probably spiritual warfare or something. I don't know. And because of my experiences with sleep paralysis, I raised my hand and I said, well, what about the incubus and the succubus? And my my professor gave me this very blank look, and it became very clear that no one in the room, including the professor, had any idea what I was talking about. And I had to kind of tuck tail and back slowly out of the room after that one. People thought I was pretty much a nutcase. <laughs> Give me an example, Vicki Joy. Let's deal with sleep paralysis first, and then we'll deal with uh, night terrors second, of an individual who had sleep paralysis as they were going to bed, Then, how have they told you their story? Oh, I've heard a million of them, George. I, I love it when people say, you never you never heard anything like this, and <laughs> it's usually the 20th time I've heard it. <laughs> that's, not, that's not to diminish the experience, because for anyone who's had it, it's terrifying. But uh, most people, it's really interesting, George, uh, a lot of people will even have a premonition before they go to bed that it's going to happen. A lot of people talk about this. And, of course, the scientific explanation of that is, well, you become a self-fulfilling prophecy because if you're dwelling on it and fearing it, it's going to happen. But it's a very strange thing that unless it's happened to you, 
you won't understand it. But for, for those people who are unfortunately experienced in this area, the torment actually starts before you even fall asleep. And then when you go to sleep, it, it can start in the dream realm. So you're having a nice, normal, sweet dream, and then all of a sudden these entities enter into the dream world. And most of us will say, oh, no, not again. And so the, the torment can actually last well beyond the actual five or ten minutes that you're in the room struggling to wake up. That's interesting take. Now, would you say... Night terrors are worse than sleep paralysis episodes? Well, oh, that's a great question. I've never had night terrors, but I've talked to people who do. And I guess the advantage to night terrors is by the time you wake up, you have no memory of it. You usually are being told by a family member who you woke up that it happened. But even that can be perplexing because that's, that's confusing when you – when you're being told all of these things are happening to you that you have no memory of. And I suppose that is kind of one thing that they have in common with the UF, with the UFO experiencers because they've got some missing time and they understand that something's happened, but they don't necessarily remember. So the, the, tra- the traumatic thing about the sleep paralysis is you kind of remember every second of it, and it can affect then your lack of desire to go to sleep the next night, et cetera. So I guess there's give and take. I mean, if someone asked me which one would you prefer, it'd be kind of an ironic wager because no one would prefer either one. Uh, but I think the, the danger in both of them is whether the experiences are remembered or they're not, and whether they're traumatic or they're not, I think that there's other things going on during these experiences that attach or piggyback from from the astral realm into the physical realm. And that, I think, is what's dangerous about it is the, the part of the experience that we remember isn't necessarily the whole of the experience. And so if someone is trying to deal with getting rid of it or they're trying to close doors or they're trying to make their peace with God or whatever they are doing to rid themselves of this, this harassment, they, they probably don't even have the whole story as to what's gone on with them. And, and that's where it gets mysterious, and that's where it gets uh, uh, difficult to really get to the bottom of it. Because I think that there's aspects of this experience that is, like in the UFO encounters, is wiped from our memory. Of the two episodes, sleep paralysis and night terrors, are they just both bad, or is there one worse than the other? I I think that they are both traumatic experiences for the people that experience them. Uh, I I think with a lot of people who have night terrors, it's many times it's accompanied by sleepwalking. So even if they don't necessarily Hmm. remember the dream or they don't remember screaming, uh, a lot of times they'll wake up having slept walk and they'll be disoriented. And it's especially terrifying when they've made their way out of the house. Um, I had a close family member who had night terrors and would sleepwalk and was found out in the street quite often. Many people who have talked to me have said that mom and dad would find them in in the front yard or down the street. So that's kind of uh, what makes night terrors a little uh, risky and dangerous. And But I, I think that the things that make it most dangerous, it, it's not that you're going to die in your sleep or or something like that. You know, the horror movies like to make it out to be like, you know, Dracula is going to come and suck all your blood or you're going to die or something. The, the, the side effects of, of these experiences that are the most kind of depleting are, are the fact that there are attachments that come into the physical realm with you. And that's what most people who call me are complaining about is the exhaustion and the mental and the physical ailments and, the confusion and the the torment that is, is following them into the physical realm. When you're having a nightmare, is it possible you're having night terrors? It's definitely possible, but again, most people with night terrors do not have a memory of it. So if they're having a nightmare, they're probably not remembering the dream either. Or they would say, you know, hey, I don't remember screaming or sleepwalking, but I, I do remember having a bad dream, and most of them don't even report remembering having a bad dream. If these night terrors are the real deal, and these entities are visiting people, how do you get rid of them? <laughs> that 
is that's the $64,000 question, isn't it? And it, it, there's not a cookie cutter scenario because so many people are experiencing these things for different reasons. Some people are willingly and consciously opening the doors and some are not. Some are really perplexed as to why this is happening to them. And so basically uh, for, for those that are, are willfully seeking this out, I would say, you know, if you don't want 20 raccoons on your back porch every night, stop giving them hot dogs, right? You know, it's like stop doing the things that draw them. Uh, but it's not always that easy because there are a lot of people that have no idea why this is happening. And so uh, what I try to do when I counsel people on the phone is let's find the source of th these episodes and let's let's get to the source and see what door got opened and what we can do to close the door. And this can be a, a multitude of things, uh, George, and not all of them are the obvious ones. You know, if you go and you talk to a priest or a pastor, they're going to say, you open the door because of sin, or you played with the Ouija board, mm -hmm. there's like the common answers that you get. But it doesn't even have to be anything that um, that complicated, George. It can be trauma. It can be uh, mental illness, psychotropic medication. It can be bloodlines. It can be um, ancestral uh, things um, done in the, in the past. It can have to do with the home that you've moved into and the activity that's been there. So I try to work with everybody on an individual basis when they contact me because no two stories are alike. Will prayer work toward these new things? It, it absolutely will, George. And, you know, there's been quote unquote scientific studies uh, and even MUFON back in the 90s, I think, uh, Joe Jordan uh, did a, a study. I don't know that this is the result he was looking for, but it's the result that he found. He interviewed somewhere between 200 and 250 UFO abductees, and he found that a, a percentage of them had all determined on their own that if they cried out during the abduction, whether it was the Lord's Prayer, Psalm 23, or the name of Jesus, that the abduction would immediately stop and they would be back in their room awake and safe. And so that was a really controversial finding back in the 90s. I think that was covered up for a while. Does the Catholic Church get involved in this? Is this almost like an exorcism? Yeah. In fact, the Catholic Church does a much better job than most evangelical churches, unfortunately. But they have, you know, a set exorcism ritual, which is typically what they do. And uh, I, I don't know how consistently successful that is, George. I haven't heard too many people saying that that wiped the problem out for them. Not necessarily. Back to the UFO abductions. What do you think's going on there? Well, I think that it's similar, uh, but not obviously not the same thing. Uh, I think it, this is another uh, agenda by uh, supernatural or entities from a spiritual realm. Uh, they, they have a different agenda than the sleep paralysis agenda. So the way I kind of break it out into layman's terms, George, is we all know from the UFO abductions that there's some sort of medical or genetic thing going on there. People talk about going into laboratories and, and being up on the metal table and things like that. Sleep paralysis, I think, is also an abduction scenario, but you're going into the astral realm, and I think that that is more of a uh, a, a grooming that the teachers, uh, is. when you look at pop culture and, and the, the minds that have influenced us in philosophy, religion, in the occult, in literature, a lot of the of these people that to this day we admire their work, they were card carrying theosophists, they were astral projectors. And so I think in that case, the, the people that are going up into the astral realm are being uh, trained and groomed to be spokespeople for the, uh, the, the, the religion and the agenda and the governance of that, that astral realm. Are children subjected to sleep paralysis or night terrors? Yes. Yep. All the time. Uh, in fact, a lot of times the people that are subjected to the, the nightmare type agendas like sleep paralysis and night terrors, 
a lot of times they are the most vulnerable because they're um, they're targeting people that can't really defend themselves. So in addition to children, uh, there can also be people in various special needs categories, nonverbal. I also see it happening to a lot of elderly people uh, because with a child, you can chalk them off to telling stories. And with an elderly person, you can chalk everything off to dementia. So it's a very clever operation. They tend to target people that can't really defend themselves when they need to. Let's take some calls. This hour is going to fly by. We'll start by going to first-time caller Ron in Ohio. Welcome to the program. Hi, Ron. Hi, George. How are you? Great to have you with us. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. And uh, hello to uh, Ms. Anderson. Hey, Ron. Hi. Uh, I'm kind of calling uh, on my daughter's behalf. She's 24 years old, and she's a nurse. She's a professional. She's a good kid. Uh, she's been having these uh, sleep paralysis, I assume, sleep paralysis events for several years now, and we, I don't know anything about them. I'm just trying. I, I heard the show tonight. I'm just trying to get a little advice that maybe I can pass on to her. What can I tell her? Is there something she's doing that's wrong or something she can do to prevent these from happening? Just looking for a little direction here. Yeah, absolutely, Ron. You know, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book, because so many times when people experience this, they're the ones that get blamed. What did you do? You opened these doors. Did you play with the Ouija board? Are you into porn? Right. Like, we get blamed for it. Or you're nuts, right? Yeah, or you're just plain nuts, right? It's something genetic. And But what's interesting to me, Ron, I'm, and I'm glad that you pointed this out, that she's a nurse, uh, these entities, uh, according to Robert Monroe, the father of astral projection, he talked about the louche, which is sort of this mystical energy that we emit when we have strong emotions. And it doesn't, it's not just negative emotions. It, it can be fear and agony and rage and terror and things like that, but it can also be erotic type of emotions as well, which is why we see so much of the incubus activity. But the fact that she's a nurse, she is around trauma and fear and anxiety and death. She's around a lot of those emotions. And uh, it's pretty hard to come home and wash that kind of stuff off. And when you bring your work home with you and you're contemplating the loss of patients that you've grown to love and seeing families in grief and feeling helpless and all of that, it is possible that she could be attracting those entities who are feeding off of all of that negativity that is is surrounding her so uh she might want to try things like george mentioned earlier prayer and if she's not of the religious persuasion uh at least doing things when she gets home to detox intentionally from those negative emotions and to seek out joy and peace and and ways to cleanse her mind from from all of that trauma that she is likely taking home with her and, Ron, let me ask you this. How does she describe these episodes to you? Uh, she's laying there. She feels as though she's wide awake. Uh, she can't move. She can't speak. She can, you know, she's sweating. She's terrified. Uh, and I, I haven't really talked a ton uh, with her about it, but that, uh, that seems to be the common thread. Sounds like a classic sleep paralysis case, Vicki Joy. It sure does. It sure does. Ron, I'm really glad she shared that with you. A lot of people don't feel comfortable sharing it, but once we start talking about it and we kind of strip the, the fear of that away, that's when we can start getting help. So I'm really glad that she felt safe enough to tell you that. And definitely, if you can, Ron, read the book uh, that you can get from lamarzuli.com, and I'm going to spell that out for you, L A M A R. Z U L L I dot net rather dot net not, not dot com. John in Wisconsin, welcome to the show. Hi, John. Hello, George. Hello, Vicki Joy. Foremost, hey, George, John. again, another great guest that offers healing, wisdom, and opportunities for the coast to coast audience to learn. That's and I right. want to thank you, George, and your staff for bringing Vicki Joy on. Thank you. Vicki Joy, I would like to share with you my lifelong struggle with sleep paralysis that I believe caused me to go blind four years ago. And I'll preface my comments by saying, I've always learned things in life the hard way. Um, I've just been a 
terrible <laughs> at thinking things through and make poor decisions, but that's really beside the point. About 15 years ago, I was diagnosed with sleep apnea, and I went, um, uh, you know, formal study like everybody does, and they put me on a CPAC machine. Well, I did not adjust well to the CPAC machine, and I can think back to my childhood where I've never really had many nights I slept all the way through. I would wake up. Um, I never had the shadow man or an alien encounter, but I've always had somebody chasing me or forcing me off a roof or forcing me to jump. And so I've always had interrupted sleep, which I believe from your description, uh, Vicki Joy, is sleep paralysis. Well, fast forward to four years ago when I was going blind, and I went to, twice to uh, one of the finest places in the country for the eyes and saw their top doctors and they said, it's amazing, you're in absolutely perfect health, and you're going blind, and you can only come up with a theory, and the theory wasn't real palatable, but it is what it is. Vicki Joy, two weeks ago, I had my annual checkup with my neural ophthalmologist here in Wisconsin, and I asked her again. I said, doctor, I'm in excellent health. I'm 66 years old. Can you give me any insight at all why I'm blind? And she says, well, it was like I told you four years ago. You are not using your machine correctly. You don't sleep correctly. You let nightmares control you. You let everything affect you that you need to purge from. And in her opinion, that's what caused me to go blind. So here's my final point. I just want to encourage all the Coast to Coast listeners not to discount anything, um, and especially Vicki Joy, because she's bringing a lot of wisdom, and I'm an example of how sleep paralysis can permanently damage you. So I want to encourage the Coast to Coast listeners to get Vicki Joy's book for their family and friends and help them solve their issues before they have a, a life-changing uh, uh, situation like I did. And uh, Vicki Joy, thank you for all you do, and keep up the good work. Well, John, thank you so much for those very kind and encouraging words. And, you know, I'm going to have to eat my words. I said earlier, I, when I, I, I've heard everything 20 times. I've never heard that, and I'm definitely going to be contemplating mm -hmm. that and bearing things like that in mind and further research. One little thing I do want to mention, George, and I know this is a little odd, and I do not want people to hear me saying that I don't believe in sleep apnea or if you have sleep apnea, don't use your CPAP. But one of the bizarre questions I started asking people that call me who have had sleep paralysis uh, consistently for decades, it seems like an unrelated question. I asked them if they've had breathing problems or if they're mouth breathers. And to date, George, every single person I have asked which has only been a couple dozen, have all said that they have had various breathing and mouth breathing issues. And mm. that, that's, that really pertains to a lot of sleep paralysis. People wake up, um, they say they can't breathe, it feels like they're being suffocated. I had trouble breathing out of my nose most of my life because of all of the reconstructive surgeries I had had on my nose. So I uh, can't say that I've really come to any formal conclusions on that yet, George, but uh, another thing that sleep paralysis sufferers seem to have in common are potential issues with the breath and with breathing. Just Interesting. Fascinating. Would you say your book is like a study guide? Yeah, it, it is like a handbook, George. It can, like, the chapters can definitely be read out of order. You can skip to the good parts if you want. Uh, and I, I kind of set it up that way on purpose. There's people that want to go right to Chapter 4 because they just want to know about the succubus and the vampires. And then there's people that want to go right to Chapter 6 because that's the solutions and who, why am I a target. And so uh, I think that's a good way of stating it, George. It is kind of like a handbook. West of the Rockies, Keith's with us in California. Hey, Keith, go ahead, sir. Hey, good evening, everybody. Love Hi there. The show. Been listening for a long time. Thank Love you. I ever hear on here. Thank you. Um, I, I I had a situation about maybe oh, I'm thinking three or four years ago, where I've had this happen a few times. I get the sleep paralysis thing, and I kind of wake up and I feel like and I look at, and it looks like there's somebody on me. I guess that's what you what you shadow people or something like that. Yep. Yep. Uh, but anyway, um, so I um, one time I the last time I had that happen, I woke up and I could see I could feel someone. It's like someone was pinning me down, and I'm laying there. And the more the more I couldn't move, the madder I got. And I, <laughs> I'd already had a bad day at work, so I was already in kind of a bad mood. And I woke up with this, so I'm laying there, and then finally I got mad. And I, it took every ounce of strength I had, but I finally 
and just kind of just like shoved it off like I, I like I was swinging at it. I don't know if I hit it or just pushed it or what. And I saw something leave from the top of me, and then it just kind of disappeared. So I don't know if that'd be uh, – I don't know what you'd originally call that, but – It could be the old hag syndrome, Vicky. Yes, yeah, that's what I was thinking as well, George. A lot of people report actually – seeing the entity on top of them, and it can be a variety of different entities. Some don't see it, but they feel it. Um, other people uh, can can wake up, and some even report seeing bruises and scratches and various things that are evidence that something was pinning them down. So, uh, Keith, lest you think you're losing your mind, uh, you are experiencing something that many, many other people have reported. And Vicki Joy, explain what the old hag syndrome is. Yeah, yep. The old hag syndrome uh, goes back into this idea that you wake up and there is something on top of you. Uh, I think um, the reason it's this old hag is the succubus is a shapeshifter. And I think a really good example of this is in the movie The Shining, when the Jack Nicholson character goes into the bathroom and sees the beautiful woman and they're making out, and then he catches wind of her in the vanity mirror, and she turns into this old woman and starts cackling. And even though that's not a sleep paralysis scenario, that's a good depiction of the old hag. And some people wake up and they see this grotesque old woman on them, but many people wake up and they see a beautiful, a beautiful woman. And at some point in the experience, uh, she shapeshifts into the old hag. Uh, but the, the old hag is one of the um, masks that is worn by these succubus entities. Brendan's with us in Austin, Texas. Hi, Brendan. Go ahead. Hey, can you hear me? So far. Okay, awesome. Uh I had a question about the Hill Country and about Seguin. Uh, I talked to your friend Kristen on the 25th, and I talked about how one of my coworkers had said that they had uh, woken up with paralysis and like a gray crossing the living room. And Whitley Strieber's from our area, and I've also seen a gray. So I just wanted your opinion on the Hill Country and why so much strange stuff happens here. Hmm. That's a good question. I don't know that I've really done a lot of research specifically to uh, populaces or particular locations where sleep paralysis entities are more common. Uh, I know that there is probably research out there, especially since you're talking about the grays. Could be a and portal. It, yeah, that, that's a really good uh, estimation there, George. Uh, it is interesting. You don't hear it as much, but there are sleep paralysis stories where the entity that shows up are the grays. There is a little bit of a difference in, in how and why they appear, and I don't want to diverge too far from Brendan's question, but uh, typically when you have a sleep paralysis encounter with the, uh, the alien grays, uh, rather than darkness, there's a bright light, and rather than the door or the bed, there, there's more that has to do with the window. There's more of a pulling out of the window. But, Brendan, I'm, I'm sorry, I, my research sort of falls short by, um, by way of why some locations seem to have more activity. Now, I can speak in generalities about ley lines and, you know, old buried Canaanite altars and... Uh, there's references in the book of Daniel where the prince of Persia had detained the angel from getting to Daniel. And so there's a lot of speculation as to whether or not certain areas have certain entities assigned to them. Uh, and there's a lot of biblical evidence there uh, with the, the 70 nations that were demarked at the Tower of Babel that all of the nations, all the 70 nations, have their own prince assigned to them. Uh, but by way of the people that talk to me, they are they are all over the place. Um, you know, I know that Bigfoot and uh, certain things like that, they do have certain areas where they're spotted more often than not, but sleep paralysis is something that can kind of strike anyone anywhere. There's, there's uh, reports of it in every country uh, and every state. Vicki Joy, how do we know that when somebody dies in their sleep, they haven't died of some severe fright caused by one of these entities? That is a great question. We don't know, do we? We and don't. The reason, 
<laughs> the reason why Americans kind of poo-poo that is it's like, well, this isn't the movies. But I will tell you, I have a personal friend who publicly told this story, and this is something that happened uh, either in 2020 or 2021. Just an amazing story. He had received an email, and it had a whole bunch of pictures attached to the bottom. And they were pictures of, like, the moon. And so he was on his cell phone before he was going to bed, and he was just scrolling quickly through these pictures. And the very last picture was a horrific, demonic-looking entity. And, George, I can't explain it, and I know it sounds weird, but he said that something leapt out of that cell phone into him, and he wrestled with this thing for two hours or more, you know, uh, crying out the name of Jesus, praying against it. He did prevail, and he contacted Russ Dizdar, our friend mentioned earlier, and Russ spoke with some missionaries in other countries, and it was determined that this is a very particular demon. They knew the name of it, and we don't disclose it because people don't need to know how to spell it. That's good, but hold on, uh, Vicki. We'll come back, finish up that story, and take final calls. And welcome back. George Norrie with Vicki Joy Anderson. Her book is called They Only Come Out at Night. We'll take final calls in a minute. Vicki, I'll let you finish that story you were into. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely, George. So we were talking about how do we know that people aren't dying in their sleep of this. And I was telling a story of a personal friend of mine who has publicly spoken about this event that occurred in, I think, 2020, 2021. And uh, after this uh, entity popped out of a photo on his phone and he wrestled with it uh, with heart attack-like symptoms for a couple hours, he uh, contacted Russ Dizdar the next day, and Russ contacted some boots-on-the-ground missionaries in uh, a foreign country, and they knew exactly what this entity was and who it was. This is an entity that can only be summoned through a blood sacrifice, and they, it is summoned to target men in the ministry, because uh, this is not a Christian country or a country that is open to Christianity. And so men who are in seminary or in the pastorate are targeted, and... Uh, what happens is they, they summon this entity and they die in their sleep of a heart attack, of cardiac arrest. So to answer your question, George, uh, here in America where we don't believe in such silly things and, you know, we're all educated and civilized, how do we know? We, re we really don't, do we? We don't. Back to the phones. Let's go to Lori in Maui, Hawaii. Hello, Lori. Go ahead. Hi, George. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. I'm a fan of yours, and I'm originally from Hamtramck, Michigan, yeah. and having lived in um, Lahaina, Maui for 23 years. When we first moved here, we were here maybe a year, and my husband traveled a lot to the mainland, which meant I'm home alone by myself. And one night, or I would say it was like 2, 3 in the morning, I awoke feeling a presence in the room. Uh, the room was totally black. My closet door was slightly open. And I didn't see a figure, but I felt like a blackness of some sort. And it laid on me. I felt this pressure. And I, I had a chair next to my bed. And I don't know why, but I thought I could pick this chair up with my arm and sort of hit this. Thing. And I couldn't move anything except my arms. And I knew my husband was out of town, but I kept calling out his name. And then finally, um, I started reciting the Our Father as quick as I could over and over again. And finally, I felt like this thing got sucked back into the closet. And I was so terrified. I was able to move at this point. I slept with the light on for the rest of the night, and until my husband came home, I continued to sleep with the light on. And then, a couple years later, we moved to another part in Lahaina, and again, my husband's gone, and I feel this same kind of presence coming up from under the bed. But now I sort of know what it is. And like your other caller, I got angry and I said, I know what you are. You're not welcomed here and the Lord's going to save me. And he's right here with me. And I recited the Our Father again. And the thing left me and nothing's happened since. In the meantime, 
um, a, about two years after that, a friend of mine gave me a book called The Obake Files, and it's about these entities and ghosts, but all Hawaiian generated. Mm -hmm. And I read all these chapters, and then I got near the end of the book, and I read this chapter, and it described exactly what I had felt and what I had gone through. And I said, oh, my gosh, this happened to me, and it wasn't a planted in my mind because I read about this several years after this happened to me. Vicki so. Joy, I'm amazed how many people like Lori have this happening to them. It's absolutely crazy, and there's sort of some telltale markers in her story that show the legitimacy. 3 a.m., that's a common number you're going to hear. The witching hour, as some people call it. Uh, the fact that it, it's at the closet, the door and the closet and the window are kind of the three liminal spaces you hear the most of. Uh, this concept that it's blacker than black and you can't see an entity, but you know it's there. Uh, but again, corroborating this idea of invitation and permissions, that as soon as she took authority over this and said, I know who you are, get out, it had to obey. These things are extremely legalistic. And when you know your authority and you claim that authority, and especially if you're going to back it up with uh, the name of a higher power, and you're going to be claiming the name of Jesus or the blood of Jesus or the Our Father, uh, those things have to go. And so, Lori, I love your story because unlike a lot of people, you're victorious there. You took control of that situation, and a lot of people don't. They let this drag them down, and they, they lose heart, and they become worn out. And like we were talking to the man earlier when we were talking to John, uh, we can let this take over and weaken us. And so, Lori, that's just a great story, and we don't hear those kind of stories often enough. Next up, we go to Sibley in Duluth, Minnesota. Hi, Sibley. Go ahead. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. Um, I <laughs> have had uh, sleep paralysis in the past, but it's been a long time. Um, it started, well, the first time I noticed it was on, like, long road trips. Uh, my family used to do, like, two-week camping vacations. Uh, in the summer, we'd go, like, to a coast. I'm from Minnesota, so we'd do, like, 12 to 13-hour days sometimes. And, yeah, I would, yeah, would, like, realize I, I can't move or anything, and, you know, I can hear the conversations going on in the car. It's daytime, but I've, you know, fallen asleep after however many hours of playing Game Boy. But <laughs> um, that is where it started and where I first noticed it. And I had some bouts of insomnia in college, um, but never really had that. But um, after I graduated, like my last summer back at home, uh, like that summer is when it is when I could tell it was coming on. Like I would, you know, my body would just, I would like be trying to fall asleep, but, even knowing that it could happen, I would be conscious, like, please don't let it happen. No, it's and, not, uh, a, not a good feeling, is it? Terrible, yeah. And um, I remember, like, I also, I don't know, it's like I almost feel like in my mind, I it almost felt like the volume was being turned up as if I was in the middle of, like, a cafeteria or something. Like, all these conversations, like, going in, in my head and like I could almost zero in on some it was crazy um and that would happen multiple nights like throughout that summer like almost like I just prayed for times that I wouldn't have that happen um and then um that was that was just like during that summer and then a couple summers later um <laughs> I was at my friend's cabin and you know, we were out on the boat all day, and it was 4th of July, and, like, we were partying a little, but not anything crazy, and we were, you know, up around the campfire until late at night, and I finally went in and, you know, went and slept uh, on my friend's bed, and she came in about an hour later, and, you know, 
whatever, passed out next to me. And um, the next day I woke up in this, uh, <laughs> like, pristine living room. And it I had no clue where I was. Um, had no memory of going anywhere. And turns out I was, like, two cabins down. And I <laughs> have never slept walked like that. And, I mean, honestly... We are dumbfounded. Um, well, there's a case, Vicki yeah. Joy, where sleepwalking is uh, evident. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, extreme exhaustion, uh, fatigue, jet lag, stress, these are um, kind of prime breeding grounds for these experiences. Now, these aren't the causes. I don't think we have sleep paralysis because we're tired, but the more kind of of a weakened condition we're in, the more vulnerable we are, the more sort of prone we are for attack. They like to go after us when we're vulnerable. But one of the things that Sibley mentioned that you don't hear a lot, but it is common, is that when we are in these other realms or these fractal realms, our senses can be distorted. And so the sights and the sounds, like the vision can be blurry or it can be very acute, and the sounds can be reverberating or vibrational, or they can be too loud. And so a, a lot of people do report uh, almost kind of like a psychedelic trip that the senses are distorted. That is amazing. Chris in Florida, go ahead, Chris. Let's get you in here. Yeah, if, uh, sleep paralysis, uh, you're at a point I've found where you can choose to move your awareness away from or back to the physical body if you do experience it, uh, which can include the vibrating sounds, the shaking or, of the body or the bed or moving, and you feel disconcerted, you just direct energy to your medulla oblongata. That's where God's energy enters your body. And just moving your neck or bringing attention to that spot will bring you fully back into your physical body. And that can be reassuring that you'll never lose control. Uh, if you're lucid dreaming, often you're actually astral traveling and you are in confabulating, exaggerating, ignoring, or otherwise misperceiving certain details, can't fully accept how fantastic it is. So um, know that until physical death, your physical and astral bodies are connected by the silver cord, you know, that's in the Bible. Um, but uh, reinforce whatever helps you to feel less attached to your physical body, uh, associating more with your, your formless, foundational uh, causal body, and then you should uh, choose your emotionally expansive astral body in which you can take any shape, size, or form and density as you feel comfortable with divine permission. Uh, sleep with crystals and minerals nearby like uh, kyanite, selenite, and shungite, especially around your head. And uh, remind yourself before you go to bed if your you're, uh, boundless uh, capabilities and if you suspect you're, you're dreaming, consider that you're likely astral traveling and uh, ask spirit for help in revealing the truth to transform your perceptions and make the most of it. The more lighthearted you are, you know, like in Peter Pan, <laughs> the, more, uh, le the less affected you are by gravity and the easier it is to help yourself and others. Um, and uh, you don't need to fly, walk, or, or otherwise travel to a location. You can will yourself instantly to be wherever or whenever and, uh, you know, maybe alternate timelines as well. Um, but, you know, uh, you're talking about Lush earlier that uh, has uh, increases the likelihood of uh, astral travel. It hasn't happened for me. Um, they're more likely, um, and, you know, I, I will admit, though, that I know that uh, my brother who saw uh, shadow people with his sleep paralysis, and, and uh, I have had a couple nights in a row of astral abductions about uh, 30 years ago, but I called on Jesus right away. It was just instinctual to do that, and instantly I was back in my body. I was being drawn backwards, and I was just terrified that I didn't have control over my flight. So um, I called on Jesus, and just uh, instinctually and instantly I was back and, and, uh, in my body. But um, usually I'm already out. Out of my body when I realize I'm astral traveling, um, though I'm almost guaranteed to astral travel when I'm consciously drawing my attention away from the physical body after uh, an episode with uh, uh, nothing better to describe it than the ecstatic God communion, raising Kundalini. Um, Whatever you're doing, Chris, keep doing it. We're almost out of time here. And uh, Vicki Joy, I want to thank you for being on the program. But Chris sounds like he's got his act together for this. <laughs> That, that was a lot to unpack, uh, George and Chris. Thanks thanks for your comments, uh, Chris. And you're exactly right. A lot of times we think we're in our bedroom, 
but we are not. We are already in the astral realm, and uh, it does no good to try to fight and, and thrash against these things. It really does have to do with the awareness. And uh, most people do want to wake up from this experience. They are not interested in astral travel or communing with the spirits. The people that contact me are people that are, are not comfortable with this. They consider it to be um, a targeted individual. They consider it to be harassment. And these people are looking for a way to uh, wake up and get out. And so this is really two schools. Vicki Joy, I want to thank you for being on the program. Keep in touch, okay? Vicki Joy Anderson, the name of the book. They only come out at night, which you can get from L.A. Marzulli and his website at lamarzulli.net. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.